We live in a world of increasing specialization. I've lamented it in previous videos. And a question that I've gotten is, can you be a jack of all trades in this world? I think you can. I love generalists. I've talked about my love of generalists in the past, but I think there are probably more rails on what it means to be a jack of all trades in the games industry these days. If you are running your own one person indie studio, then you have no choice. You basically have to be a jack of all trades. You have to do everything. You have to be enough of an artist to make your own art or at least be able to tell good art from bad art when you are sourcing it from other places. You need to be enough of a programmer to put the thing together in Unreal or Unity or whatever engine that you're using, even if you're working entirely within a visual scripting language that is entering into the space of programming. You need to be a good enough business person to keep your studio from bankrupting you. You need to be enough of a designer to design a game, enough of a writer to write whatever text exists, enough of a UI designer to put the UIs together. The sort of simplistic answer is that, of course, you can be a jack of trades because you can always start your own studio. Not usually the most lucrative way to go, however. As we get into larger studios, the amount of specialization that becomes expected increases. If you are a two-person studio, you might break the tasks down relatively firm lines. Maybe one person is the technical guy and he also does the accounting and the other person is the more creative person. So they do the writing and the art and the music. And as we increase in size, that specialization increases. In large teams, AAA teams, often we have very high levels of specialization. We don't have 3D modelers. We have character modelers and environment artists. Maybe we don't even have character modelers. Maybe we have people who do the models and then different people who make the shaders and texturing and a different person again who does the rigging and makes it ready for animation. We almost definitely have different people doing the animation from doing the modeling. But what can happen as we specialize more and more and more is that we end up siloing the work and tasks end up falling between the cracks. And for me, that's where the generalist comes in. You can build process to bridge those gaps. You can build a very rigid process that explains how the process of creating a character starts with a designer describing it to a concept artist who draws a con piece of concept art, who, and then it goes to a modeler who builds the thing, then it splits into two places and it goes to someone to texture the thing and someone else to rig it. And then once it is rigged, it goes to the animator. And once it has animation, it goes to the combat designer to make it work in combat. The problem with that, the problem with this rigid process is it doesn't handle iteration particularly well. Ideally, you would want the animator and the combat designer working together in order to find the best timing of the animations. Ideally, you'd want the guy making the materials and the guy modeling the thing in the first place to be in communication so that you could work out where the line between the surface and the and the model is and maybe move it around to better accommodate what the shaders are capable of doing. And this is where the generalist, the jack of all trades comes in. If you are a modeler who can do a little bit of rigging and a little bit of material design, even if you're not doing it, it helps bridge that communication gap. It helps close that loop more tightly. Even better, it gives the team a little bit of surge capacity by squeezing and pushing things around. Even though your day-to-day -day job might be environment modeling, if you also have the ability to make visual effects, even if you're not the fastest visual effects artist, it means that if your level needs some visual effects and the visual effects team is currently drowning, you can provide the visual effects that your level needs. Or potentially, if things are really bad, you can provide a little bit of extra capacity in the visual effects team while the levels that you're working on are set aside temporarily. A trap that a lot of schedulers can fall into is 
treating people as if they're infinitely subdivisible. If we have this level that requires a tenth of a visual effects artist and we're going to put some visual effects in the UI and visual effects over here in this cinematic and visual effects for these combat abilities, well, that only adds up to 0.9 of a person, so we only need one visual effects artist. But in practice, the communication burden of that is so draining, it introduces so much friction that that doesn't work out. What ends up happening is that one, maybe two of those demands on that person take up all of their attention, all of their time, and everything else gets left on the wayside. There are exceptions to that. There are cases where you can schedule in that way by grouping tasks together in specific ways. But in practice, people don't come in halves. But a jack of all trade, a generalist, is able to provide some of that fractional capacity because they live inside of the existing team. That point one of a VFX artist that the UI team needs isn't really practical to draw out of a single person. But if one of the UIRs is capable of doing a little bit of VFX work, even if that work is only at 50% speed, that can provide that capacity and allow that team to proceed forward. The problem that a lot of jack of all trades, a lot of generalists have within these larger corporations is that often you aren't the best at any one thing. You're pretty good at a whole bunch of things. So on some teams with some leaders, what they see is, oh, you're kind of middle of the road and they don't recognize the value of your ability to handle a lot of different things. This is going to be a, a particular problem at organizations where there are relatively strong divides between disciplines. If you're a real jack of all trades and you can write and model a little bit and do some concept art and you, you can write a little bit of C++ code, first of all, it's going to be hard for the organization to know where to put you. But secondly, they're probably not going to notice all the things that you're capable of doing because chances are you are in one of those departments. Maybe you're an artist. So the fact that you can do a little bit of writing or a little bit of programming isn't going to come up that much day to day. Or even worse, those departments can become quite protective of their territory. If you're an artist with a little bit of programming knowledge and you decide to write some tools for yourself, some tools for the art department, there is a reasonable chance that the programming department is going to resist that because what they're going to see is that you are making these tools that are going to enter into the pipeline. They haven't necessarily gone through the regular processes. They haven't been code reviewed. They don't have test plans. And they are going to be worried about having to support these things that were created from outside their process. And there is some legitimacy to that concern. Now, when a project is nearing its finaling phase, most projects stop caring about these things. Most projects look for expedient solutions to their problems. And that's for me when the generalists really shine because they're able to fly around and deal with whatever is most on fire at any moment. They're able to be there when it's needed. I've worked with some generalist producers who are able to roll their sleeves up and get stuff done. And sometimes there are things that just need to be done. And it doesn't really matter if it's going to be maintainable long term. This is true when you're shipping the game. This is true when you're working on demos. This is true when you're sitting in a conference room at a conference and you just need to get a new video card into that computer because the old one failed or you need someone that can debug why the game stopped running. So if you want to be a generalist, if you want to be a jack of all trades, or if you are a jack of all trades and you're having some trouble getting recognition, what advice can I give? If you're going to be at a larger studio, chances are you're better off being a jack of all trades within a discipline. Know how to do a lot of different things within art or know how to write and design or be able to work in different places within your larger discipline. The smaller the project, the less people 
you have, the more that you're able to reach around, the less the departments are going to matter, the more that your ability to do things outside your day-to-day job is going to be valued. If your skills are beyond your department, if you are a programmer who can do a little bit of art, if you're a designer who can do some writing or can do a little bit of programming, what you want to make sure is that the people in your management structure know about that. Sometimes it can be useful to just pick up a shovel when it needs to be done and you can be the hero on the spot and you can be noticed in that way. But the moments when that is possible can be limited. They typically only occur at certain phases of the project. If you're on a large AAA project, at the beginning of the project, you're doing a lot of prototyping, those abilities have a chance to shine. At the end of the project, your ability to do what needs to be done, your ability to pick up any shovel has a good chance of being noticed and rewarded. In the middle, it can be difficult to show that ability. That's when specialization is at its strongest, and that's when the organization is going to most want you to stay in your lane. If you're on a project, you're a jack of all trades, and you're coming in in the middle, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of opportunity for your skills to be shown, it's useful to at least have the people in your management structure know of your other capabilities. If you have pods or some sort of feature-driven structure, then it's useful for the other members of your pod to know that if some, if you just need a some temporary UI art, you can get that done. Or if you just need a placeholder VFX, you can get that done. This can actually be incredibly valued on teams that are using the different forms of Agile, especially something that's very focused on cycle time. If you're looking to get completed things through the pipeline of your subteam, then it doesn't really matter what the people inside of the team are working on. What matters is that it takes six days to make a complete creature. It doesn't matter that you happen to be doing finger animation or hair or rigging the thing. It just matters that the throughput of the team as a whole is at a measurable velocity. And honestly, I think that's a better way to measure team speed anyway. But it's not always done that way. Sometimes project managers are going to have very rigid ways of measuring team performance, breaking it down very micro and really embedding it on the individual. But some forms of agile are very focused on throughput. And in those cases, being able to help out wherever it is needed, being able to remove whatever minor roadblock has come up is invaluable. If you're making tools for yourself and other members of your department, but the technical team is resistant to that, what I would say is don't be precious with the tools. Make the tool, show the tool, use the tool, but then be willing to hand ownership of it over to the technical team. Show them the tool and why it's useful. Show them why you made it and why it's something that you want. But if they want to recreate it within the bounds of their own processes, you should be good with that. Hopefully you aren't in a situation where they are unhappy that you created this tool because it's outside their process, but they're not willing to provide you with a proper tool either. That's not really a super functional state to be in. If you are, then you're probably just stuck with kind of a black market tool that is going to exist outside the process. So can you be a jack of all trades in AAA? I absolutely think you can. Ideally, you have leaders who understand what is needed to actually ship a game and understand that generalists, jack of all trades, are an incredibly useful lubricant, an incredibly useful filler between the otherwise hyper-specialized members of their team. If you can, show what you can do in the early stages and the late stages of the project Otherwise, make sure that people understand that you do have these other skills that can be tapped into when necessary. If you are a very broad jack of all trades, and maybe you're not super strong at any of these tasks, but you can do a little bit of everything. You can do a little bit of programming, a little bit of 3D art, a little bit of 2D art, a little bit of writing, a little bit of design, a little bit of QA. Then in that case, what actually might be a good place for you is production. Can you lead people? Can you build vision? Because if you can, then you 
are potentially very well set up to lead teams, lead smaller teams to do more things. And then planning can actually become easier because you yourself can provide the filler between the gaps in your scheduling. And you can push the team forward by your own efforts to some degree. You're going to obviously rely on the stronger people for the other skills. But if you find yourself without a UI artist for one sprint, maybe you can come in and fill that gap for a little bit. Or if you're just a few hours short on a technical task. You can help pull it across the finish line. Being a jack of all trades, if you're super strong at one of these things, isn't really a problem because those other skills can be a secret weapon that you have that you can pull out when the opportunity is right. If you are a jack of all trades who is competent in a bunch of things or even pretty good in a bunch of things, it can be a lot harder. It can be a lot harder to succeed because you need the organization to understand that breadth of skill you have to make up for a lack of depth in any one area. So when people are asking the question, I assume they're talking about that second thing, where I am not the best at anything, but I'm capable of a lot of different things. In those cases, what I would say is, if you don't currently have a job, look for smaller teams where they're going to look for broader, more generalized skill sets. If that's not an option, Look to see if you can join a project in the early phases or the late phases, where again, generalized skill set, the ability to do lots of different things is more coveted. If that's not an option, make the team members around you and your leadership structure understand that you have a broader skill set and open yourself up to the possibility of doing those things as is required. Some teams are going to be highly accepting of that, really want that, some teams will be more resistant in the middle of a, of a project where specialization is more valued. But it can be done. It can be successful. If you are a generalist, if you are a jack of all trades, know that you are some of my favorite people and there are other teams that value generalists as well. To be clear, AAA does depend on specialists. It does depend on that very deep, very specialized knowledge to get things done. It's just that as teams have gotten bigger and bigger, generalists have kind of gotten pushed aside. And I do think they still provide immense value. A special thanks to my members. They provide the resources that this channel needs to keep running. If you're interested in becoming a member, there's a link to that down in the description. We also have a Patreon if you are more comfortable supporting the channel in that way. We also have merch. I'm doubling it up. I'm doubling up high tea on the high seas today. That will be tagged in the video if you're interested in picking some merchandise up. Are you a generalist? Have you been able to get your broad skill set recognized within your organization? If you're not a generalist, have you worked with some great people who are able to fill in the gaps and work on lots of different things and get things done and solve problems? How did they make themselves known to you? Have you worked with some generalists that were problematic? That can certainly also be the case. Tell those stories down in the comments. I will see you again soon. Thank you.